All right, folks. I think we're gonna start and get going um, as people continue to filter into the room. Welcome to the uh, second to last iteration of the spring speaker series focused on the myths of public safety in the parole context. Um, this is the Harvard Kennedy School's Program in Criminal Justice Policy and Management speaker series. My name is Katie, I'm the program director, and I'm delighted to be joined here today by Latoya Whiteside from Prisoners Legal Services and Jasmine Borges from the Mass Bail Fund, um, who are gonna talk to us about parole and reentry beginning inside and the way that prison discipline, prison program access, and classification shape people's experiences and their access to an eligibility for parole. Um, before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping announcements from us. We do record these events, as you all saw, and the recording will be posted publicly on our website and on our YouTube channel uh, in the coming weeks. It takes us a little while to get things uploaded because we like to make sure that things are ADA compliant and review the transcript to make sure the closed captions are accurate, um, but those things will be posted publicly shortly thereafter. We invite and encourage uh, participation throughout the event. So if you have questions that occur to you or resources to share, please feel free to post them in the chat um, or to raise your hand. And we will also leave time for questions at the end for at least 20 minutes um, so that people can ask those questions. Uh, but again, if you have comments or things to offer in real time, please feel free to, to throw them in the chat. Um, we have one more event coming this semester on this topic on May 10th with Rachel Barco, professor at NYU Law, to talk about clemency um, and access to executive mercy in all of its forms, pardons, and commutations. Um, and we're really grateful that so many of you continue to return week to week. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers for today who are going to join me in a moderated conversation. Uh, first up, we have Latoya Whiteside, who is senior attorney at Prisoners Legal Services of Massachusetts. She joined PLS in October of 2018, where she founded and directs the Racial Equity and Corrections Initiative. Since joining PLS, her work has focused on forging connections in communities of color and improving the conditions of Black and Brown prisoners in Massachusetts. She is a 2020 graduate of the Shriver Center on Poverty Laws Racial Justice Institute and a Massachusetts Legal Assistance Corporation 2021 Racial Justice Fellow. Um, her work uh, also has included serving on various state and paneled legislative commissions, and you can read all of the details on our website in her full bio. Jasmine Borges is an organizer, advocate, and activist with the Massachusetts Bail Fund. Um, she focuses on the liberation of all our brothers and sisters behind the wall, and she is also a formerly incarcerated expert who has personally experienced the prison and parole systems in Massachusetts directly and through her family, as well as a mother and a leading advocate for no-cost calls in Massachusetts. Um, we are so grateful to have you both here with us today. And uh, to begin, I think we're going to just do some kind of landscape setting. Um, so, you know, as I said, our speaker series is focused on parole this semester, but some of the most important things that affect parole and reentry or entry to begin with, right? I think there's a lot of problematizing of the word reentry in this space um, for people who were disenfranchised before ever going into the policing and prosecution and punishment system. Um, but we're focusing on what happens to people inside prisons and jails today. So, prison classification, prison discipline, program access, and how each of those systems fuels racial disparities and who goes before the parole board and the reception they get when they get there. So I figured we could start with just your own kind of introductions about what brought you to this work um, and the kind of nature of the work you're engaged in, general information about uh, your backgrounds. Let's start with Latoya and then pivot to Jasmine. Hello, thank you for um, the introduction and uh, really thank you for um, having us on and giving us the space and opportunity to talk about such an important topic. Um, as you mentioned, I am a senior attorney at uh, Prisoner Legal Services, and I'll, I'll focus more on why or how I kind of moved into this space of, of race equity work. And I think um, a lot of it centers around the fact that the carceral experience often when um, and we have these scholarly conversations and just when we are addressing mass incarceration, the carceral experience itself is, is missing, um, ironically, from those, those conversations. We talk a lot about prosecutorial discretion and uh, policing and juvenile sentencing, and then we jump to reentry. But what's missing is the actual carceral experience. And, and being that that prisons and jails are are often some of the most archaic examples of, of structural racism, 
um, today it it would you know serve the purpose that these um, issues and the experiences of black and brown bodies um, from behind the wall are a part of these conversations. And so that was really the um, the budding and and the beginning of uh, the race equity and corrections initiative. Um, which uh, is uh, the goal in our mission is to begin to challenge the day-to-day -day discriminatory practices of, of corrections and how um, it uh, disproportionately impacts black and brown bodies. And so um, just very briefly about the work, um, it's uh, something that is in the very um, beginning stages um, being that um, not only in the state of Massachusetts, but throughout the state, um, uh, substantive racial demographics is not collected. They uh, aggregate information such as um, population trends, crime trends in, in the state of Massachusetts, very uh, minimum information regarding um, solitary confinement. So uh, what we have is we have a, a, a kind of void and a, a black hole of, of data. And so um, a lot of what REICI has, has uh, kind of endeavored to do is to begin to collect that substantive um, uh, data as well as um, to begin to push the legislation so that the collection and aggregation of this type of data uh, can be mandated through the state. For that, Jasmine, will you give us a, a brief introduction similarly about what brought you to this work? Yeah, uh, thank you, Katie and Latoya. Thank you all for joining us on this important conversation. Again, my name is Jasmine Borges. I'm with the Massachusetts Bail Fund. For any of you who do not know what the bail fund does, we're an abolitionist organization that helps community members pay cash bail that can't afford to do so. Um, and we do so in the hopes that people can come home and fight their, um, their alleged crimes or cases uh, as free people, because we know that as free people, you have a better chance of not being incarcerated rather than being already held pretrial and then <laughs> sentenced and going upstate. Uh, what brings me to this work is, you know, I'm a formerly incarcerated woman. I served 12 years at MCI Framingham. And what I experienced inside the walls and then what I experienced from, from coming home and reentry, it just, it's not, it's not your usual experience. It's an experience like none other, being told what to do, how to do it and when to do it. Um, you know, the racism, the sexism that happens, the the violence that happens behind the wall and nobody's aware of it. And then coming home and trying to readjust and there's nothing put in place to help you to re readjust to this society that deemed you irreparable. Um, so I always knew that I would become a freedom fighter, but I didn't know in, in what capacity that would turn out to be. So I'm freedom fighting at the um at, at the bail fund, and you know I continue to to be a part of the community and organize. I'm organizing with the no Lo no longer three fifths coalition to reinstate the vote to incarcerated folks. Um, so that's what I'm currently working on. I'm also working towards my master's in project management, and um yeah, this is this is important to me. So thank you for having me here. Thank you. Thank you both so much. And just an aside, it's not on topic, but it's on topic with what Jasmine just mentioned, which is that big news today in the Massachusetts legislature is that, uh, you know, two bills that were uh, proposing a constitutional amendment to restore the vote to people who are incarcerated with felony convictions passed favorably out of committee. So that is the farthest that initiative has gotten in Massachusetts um, in the last 20 years when the vote was taken away in 2000 uh, from people who are incarcerated on a felony conviction. So just want to celebrate that uh, next milestone in that fight um, to restore the vote. Uh, okay, so getting us back on topic. Um, thank you for indulging my uh, aside for a second. I figured it would make sense for us to start with talking about the classification system, right? Classification is a process by which people are set to a particular security level prison, and that affects pretty much everything that happens to them in prison, right? It affects what programs they get access to, it affects what kind of disciplinary procedures they're gonna experience, uh, what sec the security level is gonna be in terms of staffing, um, a, a whole range of 
things that shape somebody's experience. So maybe Latoya, you can start us off with talking about just kind of some background texture. What is classification? How does it work in Massachusetts? Um, I think before I get into the logistics of, of classification, just kind of giving background about where the objective uh, point-based classification system started. So in, in 1994, um, uh, the department, the Massachusetts Department of Corrections hired an individual by the name of Michael Forcier, who was a behavior scientist, and he was tasked with uh, auditing um, the, the classification process. And uh, what he, his report came back and said was that um, the, essentially the classification process itself was too subjective and it was resulting in this kind of backlog of, of individuals not classing, being classed down to uh, lower level security. So um, the DOC took that report, went to the legislator and said, hey, we need funding in order to um, open up more and create more beds for, for minimum. And so um, and initially that funding was intended to create this, um, I, I guess, larger array of, of uh, minimum beds and pre-release beds. But then there was an incident at Walpool. Um, unfortunately, an officer lost his life. And then those funds were suddenly reallocated to um, thereafter build Sousa Baranowski, which is the current maximum security uh, prison. So um, I wanted to mention all of this because this is really, um, that process is really what sets the, sets the stage of who um, has the ability to access minimum and lower uh, security pre-release release beds, which have historically been reserved for, for white prisoners. And so um, with the creation of the maximum security, you, you've seen a lot of uh, black and brown individuals being um, kind of uh, shoveled um, in, in that direction and having an even uh, less opportunity to be classed down to these minimums and uh, to the pre-release facilities. So I just wanted to kind of give a background on uh, how that kind of came into existence. So then just um, talking about classification itself um, and uh, where that begins. So uh, all male prisoners are, are processed through MCI Cedar Junction. Um, by a booking intake orientation and then the classification process, whereas uh, female prisoners go directly to MCI Framingham. And they usually, um, th the process itself is called intake. It usually takes about 12 to 16 weeks following the, the prisoner's initial arrival into the system um, before they actually appear before the classification board, which is then where they determine both the um, individual security level as well as their institutional placement. So the, the security levels are divided into uh, pre-release, um, minimum, medium, and then maximum. And then the classification board, um, they're responsible for determining um, not only, again, where uh, an individual would be classed, um, but also the treatment recommendations based on that individual's um, crime committed. So they uh, they will administer something um, that they uh, call a compass, where it's just a series of questions where they will ask a prisoner whether or not they have a history of substance use um, uh, and various other questions that they uh, think will assist in their uh, rehabilitation process. Um, there's also two types of, of prisoner classifications. There are there's the initial classification, and then there's the reclassification. So the initial classification again is determines the individual's placement, um, and they the individual when you first. Um, come into custody, you will go before a class board that's uh, generally a panel of three individuals, um, and they will um, go through a series of, of questions, um, which are uh, variables to determine what your actual level of custody will be. So the, the variables that they consider would be um, severity of your current offense, uh, severity of the convictions um, within the last four years, um, history of escape or attempts to escape. They also look at things like um, history of prior uh, institutional violence within the last four years, um, education and the individual's employment. And then based on the um, accumulation of all of those variables that would determine the individual's custody level. So if you have 12 or more points, you would go be sentenced to maximum custody, which is Susan Baranowski. If you have seven or two, 11 points, you would go to min a minimum facility, which would range from Norfolk, Concord, Shirley, MCI, MCI Shirley, um, 
And then if you have six or fewer points, then you would be classed to a minimum custody facility. Um, and then as far as reclassification hearings go, um, that, is, that generally happens annually, um, although um, in some instances it can happen biannually, and that's uh, when an in individual may be in protective custody or if the individual has had some type of discretionary override applied to their classification, then they would be um, eligible for this kind of biannual uh, review to determine whether or not they have the ability to step down. So again, during that process, the, the prisoner would go before a three board panel. Um, they would, uh, again, make the, the necessary recommendations in terms of uh, the points um, that they would um, attach to the individual. And then they would also recommend any necessary overrides. And then uh, once that process happens, the prisoner would have the ability to appeal or um, to challenge that decision uh, in writing within five days. And if that individual does appeal the decision, it would have to go before DOC's central classification department, which is in Milford. And then you kind of start the, the process all over again. Yeah, that was such a, a helpful kind of background structure for, for what we mean when we talk about classification. I think some of the terms you used might uh, be important for us to unpack together, uh, including in particular this notion of restrictions and overrides, right? I think um, we've got the this notion of an objective point-based system, right? And it's it's only objective insofar as, uh, you know, it's not there, there is a rubric, right? There, there are specific things that have to be scored uh, theoretically consistently across everyone who's admitted to DOC custody. Um, but this questions of restrictions and overrides, right? These are policy-based or discretionary um, decisions where even if somebody's raw score as indicated by the weighting on that rubric says they belong in, based on their points, they have a, a total of two points on this scale, they belong in minimum or pre-release, right? That's the appropriate security setting for them, the DOC has the system where people can still be ratcheted up to a higher security level, right? Um, and that's particularly true, I think, for people who are in male designated facilities, right, because there are, is a bigger range. Um, I do want us to talk also, and Jasmine, I want you to talk in particular about what this is like in Framingham, where there isn't as much range. And in fact, the DOC system recently took offline one of the pre-release minimum settings, right? South Middlesex Correctional Center is one of the prisons that was closed within the last three years. So there are even fewer options in terms of what, uh, you know, prisons where people can go, whereas there are more options, but in some ways there's also downsides in that because DOC has defaulted to higher security settings, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, first, I would just like to backtrack a little bit and um, discuss who the uh, classification panel board is comprised of. And that's actually, they're made up of the correctional program officers along with correctional officers themselves. And that's problematic in itself because if you do not have a good rapport with your CPO or a high ranking CO, whether it's the Sergeant, Lieutenant or Captain, now sitting on your classification board, there's gonna be bias, right? There's gonna be prejudice against you. And, um, that is something that I, I experienced in one of my own classification hearings. Um, in Framingham, you know, like Katie said, we don't have a max. So, you know, your crime, depending on your crime, your points skyrocket anyways. And then every year because of your crime, it stays at that level, at that, at that um, number. Um, for me personally, it was just like, you know, talking about, the very initial classification hearing that I had, they were asking me personal questions where I had no rapport with any of these, these people. I did not openly tell them that I had drug abuse, substance abuse issues, mental health issues, trauma, violence. I didn't feel comfortable talking to these people. I had no idea who they were. I was literally in two months at Framingham. So, you know, I said nothing. And because I said nothing, I was offered nothing. And so then it became a fight, a 10 year fight to just get mental health services. And it became like a five year fight to get into a substance abuse program. So 
there's that 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 thing is happening also and i i definitely want to highlight that because you don't feel comfortable you're in this intake process you have no idea what they're going to do with this information so where i come from silence is key you can't use it against me you know and also where i was in my own process at that time was there was just things that i hadn't even uncovered yet about myself that i was willing to say out loud you know um so then like when I was finally eligible to be classified to minimum, that was a fight in itself. The gentleman that sat on my classification board was a lieutenant who bullied me and tried to intimidate me and was like just not moved, did not want to send me to minimum, no matter how much work, how much program. I, I graduated from BU. I graduated from culinary arts. I um, took restorative justice uh restorative justice programs there and also facilitated circles while I was there I took Phoenix Rising which was a community program where we told our stories to community members there was a lot of life-changing moments that happened for me in prison and this man held me accountable for something that happened seven years prior and um you know thankfully I had built a rapport with the other two members on that panel who then convinced him to let me go to minimum, right? And that's so, one, that's unprofessional because my points were low enough. I was coming up on parole. I was gonna see parole. I hadn't had a D report, which is a disciplinary report in over two years. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I was doing everything that was necessary. And as their classification system was set up, I was worthy to go to minimum. Do you know what I'm saying? And that's what happens for a lot of people. If you piss off the wrong person, you're not gonna be able to go. And now in Framingham, there is no oppor opportunity to go because nothing's been replaced since South Middlesex. Yeah, thank you for sharing all of that. And I know this is like deeply personal stuff. So I really appreciate your candor. I think it's so important to highlight exactly what you just said, right? And, and to think about that in the context of the kind of background that you provided Latoya too, right? That the, the whole premise of moving to this objective system was to remove subjectivity, to remove discretion. But when you still have the individuals who are on the class board as being people who work in that prison already and who know you, which is especially true, I think, for the women's side of things where it's a much smaller population and it's a kind of closed circuit prison, right? It's just the one women's prison in the state. So people do are going to have relationships with the people who sit on their class board that there creates, uh, even in this objective scoring, lots of opportunities for discretion, and that the way that the classification rubric is structured, right, the, nearly all of the restrictions and overrides default to higher security settings, right? So it's much easier for somebody who's in that discretionary position to send somebody to a um, more secure, more punitive prison um, that is not appropriate for what the numbers on the page say is appropriate for them than it is to do the opposite, to take somebody with a higher score and ratchet down their security setting, right? I think it would uh, make sense for us to talk a little bit more about, you know, the, the fact that the severity of the offense is one of the key components of the classification scoring, right? And Jasmine, I think you talked about this in your own experience, right? That that they keep going back to, you know, what the offense is on paper, as opposed to the person kind of before the board now, um, and how that if affects not only initial classification, but also reclassification, even though, you know, social science research tells us that the thing that is most important is to look at somebody's track record within prison, right? And that's, that's what's relevant to uh, what their reclassification scoring should be. And I think to your point, Latoya, about the way that this disproportionately affects, I mean, to both of your points, black and brown prisoners, right? We're seeing that, uh, how the, the way that existing disparities in sentencing can compound in the classification process, right? Can I also add just briefly um, from the significance of this from a, a legal standpoint, because a lot of what Jasmine has, has talked about is really the DOC's ability to kind of police and manage themselves without any type of um, neutrality or, or uh, a, a, a kind of um, entity that's removed from, from their uh, everyday operations. So essentially just from, 
be, being an attorney at PLS, we have very minimum authority to challenge classification determinations. Um, the Department of Corrections has very broad authority to classify prisoners for almost any reason or for actually no reason at all. So the commissioner can simply just move a person at any time and then just say, okay, you're going to have a classification here and sometime afterwards. And, and generally that decision, legally, that decision can't be challenged um, unless there's proof that it was made for some type of improper purpose, like for race, which is very hard to, to prove, um, for religion or in retaliation for like the exercise of a, of a First Amendment right or some other protected right. So short of that box, which a lot of uh, the required factors for proof are really hard to, to provide, especially given the dynamics between the, the prisoner and, and uh, DOC administrators, you, you don't have room to challenge classification. And I think that that is really um, an important thing to note because it um, just the way classification impacts is uh, every aspect of of the individual's experience from their access to programming to their connections to community and family. Um, I, I think that that's uh, something very significant to, to at least acknowledge and, and to figure out ways to try to challenge that. Yeah, uh, that's really helpful. And I think it leads us perfectly into the next segue, which is to think about, okay, so what are the downstream consequences of classification, right? Um, you know, Jasmine's story tells us about so much about trying to get into minimum, but I think it will be helpful for our, our kind of engaged participants and audience members to understand what is it that being at a different classification, being in a different security setting, how does that change your access to programs and what kinds of, uh, you know, programs and opportunities are available? Yeah, I can go first. So, you know, uh, for me, the opportunity go, to go from medium to minimum meant that when I saw parole, they would see that I had, you know, made a pathway for myself and changed and made it to minimum, right? Because at when I first came to Framingham, not many women with the, the crimes that I had were making it there. Do you know what I'm saying? The types of felonies and, and harm, it, that just wasn't happening you know, and um, so for, for me to get there, it was to prove to them, like, I'm ready to be in society again, I'm ready to be a mother again, I'm ready to be a family, a, be a part of my family again. And um, so having that opportunity was like my main focus. And um, when I did get to minimum, I was eventually given parole, and then I was classified to um, pre-release, which then meant that I could be out in the community working which meant that I would now have uh, basically be able to hold down my own finances now. Like now I'm now I'm a taxpayer again. Now I can start taking and providing for my children again. Um, you know, and when I came home, having that money set aside for me was pivotal for me. I come from gen I come from generational poverty. So having that money meant that I could get a car and my license and drive 200 miles to see my kids out in Connecticut. So that's like the like the biggest thing about being able to be classified down, right? From medium to minimum to then pre-release. It it's everything. It's life changing. If I hadn't gone to pre-release, I don't know. I mean, I know how I am. I'm a I'm a go-getter. So I know I would have made my life happen anyways, but it was helpful. Um, so I think it's it's hard when the system is stacked against you. It's stacked against you while you're on trial and then you go into the system and it's still stacked against you, right? Because when I went to minimum, I was two, one of two Latinas there serving a long sentence, you know? Everyone was white. Everyone was serving maybe like six, six months to a year there. They hadn't really done time. So there's all of this stuff that's happening and those people holding gatekeeping don't understand how pivotal and game changing it is for us to be able to step down and enter um, into our communities. And I'll uh, piggyback off of what um, Jasmine has said. I, I really think that unless you've actually served time or you have an impacted family member or you work in this arena, it's really hard to understand how vital the step down process is. 
So just trying to put it in a context where uh, just everyday lay people can understand. Imagine being in a space 10, 15, 20 plus years where you are being told uh, what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. Literally your every move is, is curated by someone else. So it, it, it's, it's really a, almost um, a psychological um, uh, preparation that individuals have to go through um, when they're moving from this kind of institutionalized mentality to being uh, reacclimated um, back into society. You, you, you have to be given that opportunity to um, learn how to function outside of individuals who are also prisoners or, go or, go or guards. It's, it's a very um, different type of culture. And I, I have heard from a lot of clients just about the difficulties that they have experienced um, not being denied that opportunity to step down and being released immediately from maximum security or even a, a medium security um, prison. And that's not even talking about um, things like the more tangibles, like being able to have employment and save money and um, certain uh, things that you're allowed to do in, in a pre-release. Um, it's again more about the psychological aspect of, of just preparing your mind to be able to uh, reintegrate into society. And, and I think that it um, certainly plays a, a vital role in uh, recidivism rates, so much so that um, the parole board has been known to extend an individual's sentence um, just so they have that opportunity to do go through the step down process. So um, they've denied individuals parole because they haven't been able to move down to lower security because they recognize how vital it is for, for individuals just to have that kind of uh, mental and psychological um, uh, kind of reacclimation. Yeah, I think that last point is such a, a good one um, and relates to, to both of what your comments have been about in terms of how this sets people up for parole or holds them back from parole, right? So, you know, Jasmine, you talked about wanting to be able to step down the minimum in order to be able to show the parole board that there was like, you know, a different institution that had already validated that you were, you know, progressing on your, your kind of journey through, through the phases of the system as they're structured, right? And to your point, Latoya, about about, you know, what are the parole board's expectations, right? Uh, they There is, I think, pretty strong evidence that in the parts of the parole hearings in Massachusetts that are public, right, um, we only get records of decision in life sentence cases for people who are second degree lifers. All other parole hearings are closed to the public, right? There aren't published decisions. There is limited data about what's really happening in those hearings. But for lifers, we know for a fact that even when the parole board does grant parole, the vast majority of the time, they expect people to do some period of time in a minimum or pre-release lower security setting, right? So people are seeing the parole board at their eligibility date or shortly thereafter. But then even if they get granted parole within the next few months, they have to wait for a transfer down to that lower security setting, right? And then do some period of time in that lower security setting. And we know from the way classification works that their restrictions, which for lifers in particular, right, preclude people from going to those lower security settings before they ever see the parole board. Lifers are not allowed to be in anything less than medium by policy in the Department of Corrections. So there's this kind of catch-22 in the way that the DOC and the parole board interface with one another, right? And there are sometimes opportunities, depending on the sentence that you're, you're kind of governed by, where people can step down faster or step down sooner, I should say, before they see parole. But there are lots of people who go before the board who are not given that opportunity and then required to spend even more time in prison in order to go through that process of, of stepping down and kind of gradually getting back into uh, having access to the free world and, and a job and, and kind of the, the plan that Jasmine laid out of, of that she was able to, to go through. Yeah, I think um, it might be you know, helpful to think about how the parole board looks at this whole process, right? Not just um, not just classification, but in terms of program access too. I wonder if you both could speak a little bit about, you know, what are, uh, Jasmine, you spoke about some of the programs that you did personally, which is really, uh, you know, good for us insight to have. But I think in terms of 
structural issues about who gets access to what kinds of programs and what do wait lists look like in prison. Could you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I think it's worth mentioning that uh, in Framingham, right before I left in 2017, they took classification to a step further. They um, created a program called Pathways, and everyone was um, not classified, but given a survey. And at, depending on where you placed in that survey, they were you were given a number. So after you were given that number, you were then designated to a certain unit to live in. Um, and which is part of like the classification, right? Because now classification says that you have to be, um, uh, what is it? You have to be ongoing in this pathway, right? Like you have to be compliant. So part of now classification is like, are you compliant with your pathway? So they took like, they took it a step further and told people you're a number one, two or three or four. And now they're like, and you'll forever be a number three. You can never progress. If you're a one, you're least likely to recidivate. If you're a four, you're most likely to recidivate. So now they're telling people in Framingham, women, they're telling the women in Framingham, you're, you can never progress, right? So I just wanted to mention that that's actually happening in Framingham today still. Um, as far as the wait list, I would um, say that they, they were long. And um, I want to touch on the fact that lifers were denied certain programming because they didn't have an out date. So the women were denied um, cosmetology, culinary arts, um, and other programming, like the um, sus substance abuse program that they had prior to Pathways. Uh, and women had to fight. Women had to write the commissioner, the superintendent, and say, I want to be in this program, it will help me. Even um, getting higher education, the women had to fight for that too. Um, so because of classification saying, oh, you, you committed this certain crime, you can't do this programming. So that's how it affects the programming. And when then when you go up for parole, parole's asking you, well, if you have substance abuse, why didn't you do this programming? Or if you have mental health issues, why don't you, why don't you have a mental health clinician? And it's it all stems from the very beginning, which is the classification. And I also think in terms of parole working with um, with Department of Corrections, there always seems to be a, a gap in communication and understanding of the the day to day operations of, of of DLC and how that works and how it impacts. Um, prisoners, and I, I certainly think that that's uh, problematic um, in terms of wait lists, uh, speaking from an advocate's perspective, that is almost a black hole of um, unsurety. Like, we have no idea what that looks like. Um, have, I, I think a lot of clients can't really definitively say that there is this kind of concrete process um, in place that will determine how a person moves on a wait list. It's a uh, very, uh, there's so much discretion that you really can't uh, pinpoint um, how that process actually works. And what happens is a lot of black and brown individuals are, are disproportionately impacted by that. So um, one of the projects that uh, REICI um, works on, um, tries to ensure equitable access to MAT treatment. Um, and aside from a lot of the inherent uh, policy issues um, that, that kind of result in, in uh, a desperate impact, we have the issue with um, just access and who's being um, actually um, assessed for services and when and what that process looks like. And we have a lot of individuals who have said, oh, you know, my um, the, the guy across the hall for me um, is, is white and he came in three weeks ago and he's already in the program, but I've been working for the past seven months to get in and I have no idea where I am in the process and what's, what's happening. So I, I think that that um, certainly impacts an individual's uh, parole and their ability to satisfy a lot of the programs that have been uh, recommended on their compass. And I think that that is something that parole 
again, um, because they don't aren't aware of the day to day operations and how that works. They don't understand how an individual could be penalized and how certain things like them not um, engaging in certain programs are beyond their control. Yeah, that's that's such a uh, illuminating point, I think, in part because I think they're you know, it's reasonable to expect that the DOC and the parole would communicate, would have the same expectations for people, right? And that's just not what's happening in real time. And, you know, I think one other point I want to make sure we hit is that, um, you know, when people are initially classified, and as Jasmine said, given the treatment plan, right, it's in part dependent on what people say in terms of um, what kind of programming they're looking for to address what they think of as uh issues that they want to address in their own life. And um, people are also only given credit in classification for completing programs that are on their treatment plan, right? So people could be engaging in all sorts of important, uh, you know, programs that are led by and currently incarcerated people, right? Kind of self-improvement groups is what the DOC often refers to them as, um, or other kind of political associations. But those groups won't necessarily count towards uh, you know, deducting points off of their score for classification if they're not part of the DOC's recognized treatment plan, right? So there's this element of control and then also this element of kind of gap between what the DOC recognizes as, as programs and what parole expects without actually evaluating whether those programs are meaningfully available in the particular prison where the person is or meaningfully available to that person based on where they are on a wait list or what their treatment plan says, right? I think it would be um, helpful to jump into the report that you helped draft, LaToya, for the Special Commission on Structural Racism in the Correctional Facilities of the Commonwealth. Um, could you give us a little bit of background about that, uh, that process and, um, and what were some of the key takeaways from that process? Um, so the process was, uh, was, was interesting. We were tasked with investigating uh, the existence of structural racism in co correctional facilities throughout the Commonwealth. Um, being that we had a very limited amount of time, although uh, initially it was supposed to be all cor correctional facilities, so both jails, HOCs, and, and uh, state corrections and prisons, um, we had to limit our focus on just DLC. Um, and I think the biggest takeaway and the uh, biggest issue was that we were charged with investigating something that we had no data for. So we essentially had to uh, figure out ways to uh, produce this data, um, one of which being through uh, utilizing um, my, uh, my uh, organization or the Race Equity and Corrections uh, Survey. Um, which was a 51 page survey that um, I created along with um, individuals who are currently incarcerated, um, individuals on the um, AACC, as well as uh, members of the REICI team. Um, we uh, crafted this survey that touched upon um, essentially every area or, or aspect of the, the daily operations of, of corrections. Um, and uh, the survey was um, sent out to roughly 1,500 black and brown um, prisoners throughout DLC um, with the intent and purpose of um, collecting and, and thereafter aggregating um, the substantive race uh, race data that, that is missing from, from essentially every carceral system <laughs> throughout the country. Um, and so we uh, utilized the, the results of that survey, or at least tried to. There were a lot of hurdles and obstacles put in place um, in even um, being able to have the surveys distributed to prisoners. Um, uh, I think that the um, administration, it was very clear that they were not very happy and pleased with the contents of the survey. And so, um, Things like uh, the surveys just being thrown out and not being um, actually uh, distributed to prisoners. Prisoners were being lugged um, oftentimes and accused of uh, trying to smuggle in um, K2 through the survey, which was very interesting. Um, and so we had to spend a lot of time advocating to get these individuals out of, uh, you know, out of uh, solitary confinement for uh, trying to speak up and be advocates for, for something that's uh, such an important cause. 
Um, we also, uh, and this was something that I um, actually had to push the, the uh, commission to agree to um, because it's traditionally um, not something that DOC allows, but to allow prisoners themselves to provide testimony to the legislator. Um, that was something that um, traditionally DOC certainly does not do that. And it was something that we had to really negotiate and fight hard for. And they were able to uh, provide um, recordings. And uh, we played that for the commission, just talking about the various areas that they have experienced um, discriminatory treatment. And so we um, essentially gathered all of this kind of qualitative data and um, uh, the findings, of course, were that in structural racism does exist um, in, in multiple areas throughout um, corrections. Um, and then um, we thereafter kind of made recommendations about how issues could be addressed legislatively. So uh, one of the big things that um, REICI is really trying to push is the creation of an outside entity that would not only have enforcement, um, would not only have oversight uh, abilities, which we already have these oversight um, committees that only have uh, recommendation authority. So it's not even really uh, authority, it's just they can provide DOC with recommendations. DOC does not have to follow that in any means. Um, so this particular uh, piece of legislation would um, serve as an oversight for uh, DOC, but would also have enforcement powers. And so um, it's the, um, it um, was sponsored by uh, Rep. Holmes on the House side and Senator um, Miranda, Liz Miranda, um, and um, the it would be it would create an office in the office of the Inspector General. It would also establish um, basic anti-racism um, standards and policies, and essentially audit DOC's current current policies for any um, issues that that may uh, result in a desperate impact. And it would also, most importantly, uh, mandate um, the collection of substantive racial demographics. So I, I keep saying that, um, so I, I feel like I need to kind of define that. Um, what that, that means is right now, we have no clue how many black and brown prisoners are actually receiving uh, mental health services, uh, medical services. We have no clue um, what it looks like in terms of the, the layout and the landscape for disciplinary proceedings. Um, disciplinary um, issues and offenses are a lot of time very discretionary, uh, really depends on the CO. Um, uh, it's very rare for an individual to successfully um, beat a D ticket um, and uh, disciplinary tickets have very uh, far and wide reaching um, implications. And so um, having that type of data to know, you know, why are black and brown prisoners being disciplined? For what reasons? For how often? What are the, the aftermaths of, of that discipline? Um, you know, is it resulting in them being classed to a uh, maximum facility? Because there, there are two different types of overrides. There are discretionary overrides, which would be an individual individual could be classed to a maximum facility for um, uh, disciplinary um, issues or concerns. And then there's the non-discretionary, like um, an individual who has uh, their crime resulted in the loss of life. And then that individual, you know, would be uh, prevented from being able to be classed down to uh, a minimum. So uh, all of this um, information is is vital information, and it certainly impacts uh, parole, eligibility, access to programming, connections with family and community. And this is data that is missing from from the you know the the carceral narrative. And so um, I, I think that although I, I would have liked to have seen more. Um, I guess conversation around the report and the the results of the report and implications of the report and that just didn't happen. Um, I'm hoping that it will um, surface uh, with additional work that's being uh, pushed through REICI. Um, but yeah, it, I, I really think that that was just an issue that went to the commission to die, to be very honest. I think before we um, kind of wrap up with a couple of final questions and then open the floor for for other questions from the audience, you know, you just brought up Latoya the um, 
the need for more data, but also the important role of disciplinary procedures within the prison system of also shaping people's experiences and, you know, shaping directly their conditions of confinement, right, with the continued use of um, solitary confinement uh, under many names now in the system, right? It's no longer called solitary confinement. It was restrictive housing. And now we've got, you know, the behavioral management unit and the DDU, right? Um, and, uh and so that, that these things keep transforming, but not actually being eliminated, right? I wondered if the, the two of you could talk about, you know, what is the, in the same way that, you know, Jasmine, you surfaced the issue of discretion on the classification board, right? How does discretion play out in terms of D tickets and that the, the limited appeals process that is available for those? I think Latoya mentioned it, um, you know, she, she definitely said it, um, you know, a person beating a, a D ticket, like that's very unheard of, you know, it, it doesn't happen often, you know, you can, you can do this one minor thing and then they hit you with like four or five offenses, which is very reflective of like what's happening in courts today, right? You go, you might, you might have someone have a like, dispute out in the street and they get hit with like five different charges that's exactly what's happening in prisons too in jails you know you might have an argument with the ceo and now he's now you're like disrespecting a staff member disorderly conduct disrupting the unit disrupting the prison like all of this stuff is happening and you know and then you have your near you have your narrative they have their narrative you go in front of a d officer and it's like, well, you can lose canteen for 30 days, you can lose phone calls for 30 days, and that's the deal. Now you don't have food to eat, and now you don't have access to your family, friends, and lawyers um, for 30 days. 30 days is a very long time. Imagine not having this thing that is tied to our hips, hands, and, and heads, right? Like, it's tied to us. Imagine not having this for 30 days. So I think that it is very discretionary. You know what I'm saying? And in my time, I was not a perfect inmate. I did not aim to be a perfect inmate. I did have a lot of D reports and I didn't win any of them, you know? And I had to, and, to, and then I had to answer to all those D reports I had to answer at the parole hearing. And like that, that gap, like they're disconnected. They don't understand. Like if I'm like not in my unit at a certain time, I'm getting written up. If I didn't stand for count because I overslept, I still get a I still get a D report and you're sitting there trying to like, you know, you're trying to have this conversation and they're like, nope, it's a D report. You weren't acting accordingly. And nobody is perfect. Not in this world, not in that world. No one is perfect, you know? So there's definitely like this disconnect with the parole here, with the parole board. And yeah, D reports are definitely up to the discretion of the D officer. If you have an if you have a relationship or like a rapport with the D officer, do you know what I'm saying? A lot of things can get dismissed, but if you don't, it sucks. Yeah, and the point you made about how this all comes back at parole, right? I think like that that is our overarching kind of architecture for this conversation is parole is always in the background for folks, right? And, you know, each of those D tickets is not only shaping people's experience experience of parole directly in terms of how it's going to come up in the conversation during parole, right? They will, they will have before them the full record of somebody's disciplinary history within prison and will go through it point by point often to say, you know, what were you doing here? And, and the same way that they ask people to recall the specific facts of the, you know, crime that they were convicted of, they also ask people to recall the specific facts of each of those disciplinary infractions if they want to, right? Um, and all of that might be, you know, things that were really misunderstood and and yet resulted in that kind of like plea process within the prison where if you're charged as you said Jasmine with like five different offenses and some of them might be at different code levels right and so um they might say well you know you can just you know, plead to this one, um, but it might be a, a higher charge that's going to result in more serious consequences and also that affect your classification when you go to get reclassed down the line, right? Um, so all of this kind of ties together in this feedback loop and on all is in some ways a, a setup for the potential of parole or, or being released back to community of the experience of then having all this kind of punitive consequence building and compounding. I think before we open the floor 
just one more major question for, for you both um, is if you were going to design a better system, kind of what are the low hanging fruit? What are some of the key changes you'd recommend that we could, you know, that we could implement today? <laughs> I could go first. I mean, I'm an abolitionist at heart. I practice that every day at the bail fund. I do not believe in the carceral system as it exists today. I know that people make mistakes. I made a mistake. We deserve second chances. I know we're capable of change. And currently our carceral system is set up to dispose our people and um, just lock them up and forget about them and then treat them as like, less than subpar, less than human and get away with it. And then somehow we're supposed to come back for those of us able to come back into society, we're supposed to act accordingly. Um, you know, so for me, it's resourcing our communities, resourcing mental health communities, resourcing our homelessness, our homelessness population, our addicted population, um, and really resourcing the programs and and community members already doing the work you know um so yeah that that's where that's what I would advocate for and that's what I do advocate for yeah I appreciate that go ahead Latoya I think Jasmine um uh, definitely uh was well said and certainly my sentiments as well I'm an abolitionist at heart I do not believe um that uh you know the system is I think that the system is is broken and there's no way to to fix it or to correct it. It needs to be a 100% dismantling of, of the system and focusing more so on uh, trauma and the reason why um, we've gotten to, uh, you know, the position where crimes are being committed and not just um, solely uh, warehousing individuals and kind of throwing them um, away. So uh, certainly um, more funding more resources into um, uh, addressing issues, uh, whether they're um, economic, uh, mental health, uh, medical, um, and uh, also focusing more on restorative justice. Um, I, I think that that's also a, a really important aspect and something that um, continues to be overlooked uh, by our current system. Terrific. Thank you both for, for those comments. We're going to open up the floor now. And again, our meetings go until about 545. So we've got a little over 15 minutes for questions. Um, we do have uh, some comments in the chat and one question um, uh, so far. But if folks have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat now or to raise hands. Uh, we can go through some of the comments first. Um, one comment was from Lynn Sullivan. Lynn, I don't know if you're still on the call, but if you want to uh, unmute Anne and make your comment, and, and uh, we would welcome that. Hi, I'm Lynn Sullivan. Um, hmm, comments on that one. I'm trying to think which one I made, and I believe it was about the lifers and the access to programming. Well, the fact is, a lot of the lifers that are incarcerated at Framingham at the time that well, back in the uh, uh, early 2000, 2000s, I guess, 2014s and before, um, you weren't allowed to go into certain programs because you don't have an end date. So if a lifer doesn't have an end date, you couldn't sign up for certain programming, but you couldn't be granted parole unless you obtained those programs. So it was like Jasmine mentioned, it's a total battle where you have to literally go over the heads of the DOC in order to get what you need in order to be able to be even considered for parole. And, and that was one of the biggest barriers. And the fact is that there's no individualizing as far as the points go. It's just based on a number and based on a crime set on, you know, the risk assessment. It takes away the humanity of it because everybody's not the same. Everything's different and nobody knows the why or what happened to the person, bringing them into these positions. And that's the thing that we keep, seem to forget is what happened to you, to bring you there. And parole doesn't seem to look at that aspect of it. it. It has to really be brought to them. And you also have to bring into the parole boards, you have to make sure you have a strict plan for yourself. Straight up, you know, I, I need to integrate. You need to take those baby steps all the way into integration, depending on what kind of time you have. But where we fail the most is reentry starts from day one. 
the day you walk in the door, we're not supposed to be waiting months before you see classification. And you need to have this fast track to education in order for this to be successful. That fast track to education starts from day one with re-entry, not basing it on a point level on where this person should go on that point level, but no, this person has two years and that means he can obtain some kind of skill set at this facility. So let's send him there. Or well, wait, this one can only manage to get a GED because they only have a, a small period of time. Let's get him an OSHA. Let's get him a GED. Somebody can get a BA, send them to the facility that can get the time level for them in the most education so we can prepare them to break down those barriers when they come home. So yeah, I'm, yeah I can go on a roll. Jasmine. No, that's great. I think, I think everyone's nodding along with you, Lynn, because uh, I think those are really complimentary points. You're getting some applause in the, in the chat too, uh, from, uh, from what we've already discussed on the panel. And you're, you're absolutely right that, you know, the whole orientation of the system, right? Classification is a security protocol. It is not about a needs-based assessment of what is going to prepare somebody when they leave that setting to be able to get employed, get housing, right? And it is it absolutely falls to individuals to set up what their home plan is going to be like and to be able to prove to parole that they were able to create these connections to community while they were still locked up, even though they were denied those accesses to community at every turn, right? Um, so I think it's really helpful for you to problematize that. And we really appreciate that comment. Latoya and Jasmine, I don't know if you want to add anything. You're welcome to. No, I know Lynn. She's very special to me and she said it all. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you, Lynn. We've got a question from Lisa Berland in the chat. Lisa, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Sure. Um, hi, Jasmine. Um, okay. Um, so I've lately been doing a deep dive into the parole rates for women lifers, uh, <clears throat> at least looking at decisions for the last since 2015, which is what is posted. And the rate is um, like 30% um, positive parole compared to 50 for men. So I'm curious, I mean, I'm just sort of looking at this, starting to look at this, and I'm, I'm wondering whether that could have a little, a piece to do with lack of particular programming for women at Framingham. I, th I think it's a really good question, Lisa. And I, I've had that same question in part because in Massachusetts, our parole board also serves as our advisory board of pardons. And, you know, one of the other things that we've seen a minor uptick, but it's also significant insofar as, you know, there, there, for, there was a period of decades where there were no commutations happening of reducing life sentences without parole to life sentences with the possibility of parole, right? That for, we saw 20 years where that was the case in Massachusetts, we just didn't see any of those. And then in the last year, we've seen three, but they have all been men. And I know there have been women who have applied in part because there's been a statewide clemency campaign led by Families for Justice is Healing and the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated women and girls that has supported a lot of women to apply for clemency who are inside Framingham, and yet there have been none granted. And I know um, in particular a couple of women's cases where the reasoning given by the parole board sitting at the advisory board of pardons was precisely that. It was, you haven't completed enough programs, and it was in this particular case a woman who had completed every available program, right? So um, in, in some ways that is a denial that is pro forma, right? They're saying we, we haven't seen enough programs, but there literally weren't any others available to to her that she could have completed because of the program availability in that prison. And it's the only state prison for women now, right? Um, there are a limited number of pre-release beds that were created during the COVID-19 pandemic um, through the Middlesex County Sheriff's Office. So uh, at the Bill Ricca Jail, there are, I think, eight beds um, that are specifically kind of pre-release beds for women who are on state sentences. But besides that, it's MCI Framingham or bust for women in Massachusetts. So it's a really good point, Lisa, and I think definitely worth a deeper data dive. Definitely. Thank you. I would just add to that, Katie, you mentioned it earlier that there's programming allotted to us that the DLC doesn't take into consideration, right? Because it's it, they're not giving us good time for those programs. And those programs include NAAA, um, if you have a spiritual guidance, uh, person in your life, which is a spiritual director that comes and visits you and you're getting this spiritual direction. None of that is accounted for because you don't get good time. So the DOC doesn't recognize you as attending programming. So there's that thing where there's not enough programming, but also 
what is actually considered a program, you know? Yeah, also I just wanna add that I know from the parole board that, um, you know, restorative justice is very high on their list of things that they look for. And I don't know whether that's available at Framingham. No. Okay. Thank right. You. Yeah, and I think, you know, to, to speak to that point a little bit more, you know, one of the common themes that's come out of not only the report that Latoya worked on uh, of the structural racism in the correctional facilities of the Commonwealth, but also the separate report that was released from a separate legislative commission on structural racism in the parole process, right? One of the common recommendations, I think, to those reports has been there needs to be more coordination between the DOC and the parole board about what programs are actually available in the prison that can be taken into consideration in somebody's parole hearings. So I think the recommendation that came out of the parole commission was that there should be a representative from DOC from that prison available during the parole hearing who can answer board members questions about was this program meaningfully available, um, which I think is potentially a good stopgap. I wonder if actually this should happen further upstream, right? Like parole should be given a list of available programs in that prison as part of the intake process when they get somebody's questionnaire, right? Which happens before anybody ever actually gets to their physical in-person hearing before the board, um, as opposed to waiting on uh, what's gonna happen in real time, which is a kind of high pressure setting and somebody might really feel um, concerned about that if that question is being asked in front of them, but not to them, right? I don't know if you all have thoughts about that or kind of, I know your answers were excellent about thinking about uh, upstream reforms from an abolitionist perspective, but I think there are certain, you know, potential uh, initiatives that we could take now that could improve people's experience and get more people access to parole as well. I agree and um, certainly agree uh, regarding education of parole prior to an individual's hearing. I think that there needs to be some type of more formalized um, communication and information sharing, um, even uh, to the point where it's before um, the individual is actually before parole, so that there's a clear understanding of uh, DOC processes and how programming works, um, how um, you know the lack of access to certain programs, whether it's an understanding of their waitlist process, um, how uh, disciplinary um, concerns. I think um, not even necessarily how disciplinary issues impact, but uh, parole actually educating them on things like uh, discriminatory treatment and, and what that looks like and maybe uh, allotting some type of point system or consideration for that until we can actually resolve that kind of those types of behaviors. I think that that should be taken into consideration. Um, yes, I, I really think the sky's the limit in terms of thinking about uh, potential reform and how to improve um, the system, but the easiest way is just to dismantle it. And so that's why I kind of just, um, it, it's so hard to try to improve on something that's broken at its core and that started out, you know, on, on um, a, a flawed um, system and started out from, from a flawed foundation. So. I, I'm not really comfortable with the idea of trying to fix something that that is doing what it's intended to do. Especially for a system like the DOC that has that is not held accountable, right? There's nobody overseeing the DOC. The DOC is policing itself, is doing whatever it wants. It shifts, it changes, it morphs, and nobody's saying, hey, like stop doing what you're doing because it's wrong, right? And I mean, people are saying that, but nobody's actually able to like change that, right? And um, so yeah, I think, yeah, reform is always possible, but like Latoya said, if the system is already broken, was designed broken, you know? Yeah, um, we had uh, another comment, I think, um, in the chat. Um, or it was a question from, from Alexander Liu asking if there were any notes or resources that we could share. I did share a copy of uh, the report that we've mentioned, but if you all have any other um, kind of places that you look to for resources on this topic or, or, or in your work, if you want to shout them out, that would be great. Sorry. 
So are we talking about just understanding the context of uh, what we spoke today, spoke about today, like quite understanding classification, or are we talking about a larger context of just like I say all of the above. <laughs> um, so uh, you can easily access the, um, and actually I can, I'm wondering if I can put it in the chat or put a link to it in, in the chat. Um, but if you're curious about a uh, classification, it's available on a uh, DOC mass.gov website. It's called the Male Objective Point-Based Classification Manual. There's also um, a manual specifically for uh, women. Um, you can access that uh, simply through Googling um, and it gives a lot of the information that I shared, um, including a nice little outline of um, how in starting in 1995 when um, this objective point-based system originated and how certain um, individuals um, in, in power um, made what changes to the system, like uh, most recently Governor Baker made a, a whole list of, of changes um, to how the system, uh, how those variables are, are uh, kind of graded um, in, in 2019. And uh, I think um, a number of other uh, individuals uh, made similar changes. Um, and I think as far as my recommendation for reading and uh, kind of understanding the background of um, uh, mass DLC, I, I think um, When Prisoners Ran Wild Pool is a really good book. Um, that is like my go-to. I actually have it on my desk. I don't know if uh, individuals can see it. Oh, I think you can't see it because of my thing, but yeah, uh, you can't see it. Um, but this is a great book um, to just kind of understand like just the uh, dynamics and also um, the origins of PLS with the uh, Attica riots um, and, and how we kind of came into existence, I think is also good uh, background information. Um, uh, John Boone, information on John Boone, if you want to uh, understand um, a lot of the, the kind of race dynamics, um, looking up that information, I think. Uh, Tell us who John Boone was, Latoya. Um, so he was the first African-American commissioner in the 1970s and uh, essentially was railroaded and pushed out because he had a lot of uh, innovative ideas around um, race equity and uh, around just programming and, and things of that nature that uh, kind of was before his time and not um, well received by, by DLC staff. So I, I'm sure I didn't give him <laughs> that much justice uh, um, kind of with this introduction, but I know that there are a few schools right now. Um, I, is Harvard one of them um, who uh, is doing like a, a symposium on like 50 yeah there was a 50th anniversary symposium about when the prisoners ran Walpole um, and the events of that uh, it was about a month ago I think it was recorded um, we were one of the co-sponsors of that but it was really led by the Mahindra Humanity Center um, and I think when that recording is made available I'm sure we will put it out on our the of a newsletter as well yeah absolutely Jasmine, do you have any uh, any additional places you look for resources about this or anything else you want to point us toward? I always point um, people towards the people that are actually living it, you know, um, women that are currently in Framingham or have been in Framingham, men as well that are incarcerated at um, in Massachusetts and DOC. I always point people towards uh, Miriam Kava if you want to read on um, abolition and Angela Davis and, you know, the giants really. But um, yeah, and I can put in the chat, uh, the bail funds uh, website, if you're looking for bail help and bail support. Yeah, phenomenal. Well, just, uh, go ahead, Latoya. I just wanna make a quick plug for REICI. We are in the process of, so we surveyed um, or sent out a roughly 1500 uh, surveys to black and brown prisoners throughout mass. Um, we were able to get roughly 630 um, surveys completed, which is a really big uh, feat in and of itself um, that we were able to get so many people to participate. And we have such a large pool of data now. Um, we're in the process of aggregating those results and we plan to um, issue a report on those findings um, as well as we're in the process of uh, producing a documentary. Um, we have over 25 um, formerly incarcerated individuals 
Um, Helen Creedle is uh, one of those indiv uh, individuals who's not formally incarcerated, but she was during the administration of, of John Boone and has a lot of very rich um, information to share. So uh, that's something that will be in circuit and coming out soon. So I'm sure we'll be hopefully uh, spreading that information in the, in the next upcoming months. Phenomenal. Thank you both so much for your time. And one final plug before we log off for the No Longer Three-Fifths event that is happening at Clark University this weekend that Jasmine started us off with, um, which is about voting rights and, and reenfranchisement for people who are incarcerated. Um, that's the event that's happening on Saturday at 1 p.m. at Clark University. Um, and just thank you both so much. Uh, Sanders in the chat saying thank you. This was incredible. We're really grateful for both of your time and keep coming back. May 10th is our last event of the speaker series. Uh, and we'll talk to everybody soon.